Professor Dave and Chegg here. Everybody knows what a battery is and may even consider them a pretty mundane aspect of technology. But the chemistry that was developed to make batteries a reality is nothing short of astonishing when you really learn what's going on inside. So let's learn about electrochemical cells now. Before we dive into electrochemical cells, let's first summarize some terms and concepts that are associated with electricity. First, we have to understand electrical charge, which is carried by subatomic particles. The SI unit for charge is the coulomb, and one proton carries 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Electrical charge will typically flow in the form of electrons or ions, and the rate of charge flow is called electric current. The SI unit for current is the ampere. An ampere is equal to one coulomb per second, so in this way, electric current can truly be considered a rate. A current will always flow in a path called a circuit, which is typically a closed path. The charge flow itself is generated by an electric potential. This is the ability of the electric field to do work, and it is measured in volts, which are joules per coulomb. This means that when one coulomb of charge moves through a potential difference of one volt, it generates one joule of energy. And lastly, it is the presence of electric charge in the form of these various particles that generates an electric field in the first place. We don't need to have a sophisticated understanding of this physics terminology, but we will be using these words frequently, so it is a good idea to at least know their definitions. Now we are ready to examine the field of electrochemistry. This area of study deals with chemical reactions that produce electricity and the changes associated with the passage of electrical current through matter. These reactions will be oxidation-reduction reactions, or redox reactions, which as we know involve electrons being transferred from one species to another, which is what will generate the electric current. These redox reactions can always be split up into half reactions, which will include the reduction half reaction, where something gains electrons, and an oxidation half reaction, where something loses electrons, and hopefully we remember the rules for assigning oxidation numbers for these kinds of processes. A galvanic cell, also called a voltaic cell, is a kind of electrochemical cell in which a spontaneous redox reaction is used to generate an electric current, and we can harvest that electrical energy to use for our own purposes, such as in a battery. In a galvanic cell, such as this one, the oxidation half-reaction and reduction half-reaction are physically separated so that the resulting current can flow through an external wire. Each beaker is called a half-cell, and each half-cell will have a metal electrode. The one that is made of the metal to be oxidized, in this case copper, is called the anode, and the one that contains the metal that is to be reduced, in this case silver, is called the cathode. The half-cells are connected by a salt bridge that maintains charge balance. Here's how this works. Copper atoms in the anode are oxidized, and in the process they become copper ions, which will fall off the electrode and enter solution. To maintain charge balance, nitrate ions leave the salt bridge and enter the oxidation half-cell. The electrons from this oxidation travel through the wire and arrive at the silver cathode. Here, silver ions from the solution in the half-cell will accept the electrons and become neutral silver atoms as they deposit onto the electrode, joining the solid lattice. To compensate for the loss of positively charged ions, negatively charged nitrate ions leave solution and enter the salt bridge, while sodium ions enter the half-cell from the salt bridge. This is how each half-cell remains electrically neutral, which is what allows the cell to conduct electricity, so without the salt bridge, this wouldn't work. When everything is connected, the cell will have a cell potential. This is the energy available per unit charge from the redox reaction, measured in volts, which is joules per coulomb. This can be measured using a voltmeter, which works by drawing current through a known resistance, and these are typically digital. Before moving on, we need to learn the shorthand that we use to communicate the materials that are involved in any galvanic cell. For example, how would we use writing to describe this particular galvanic cell? That would look like this. The left half will describe the anode. We list the material in the anode first, which is solid copper. The vertical line represents a phase boundary, which is the one between the solid electrode and aqueous solution. And then we describe the anode solution, including concentration if known. Then there is a double vertical line, which signifies the salt bridge. This separates the anode from the cathode. 
Then we describe the cathode solution, in this case silver ions, along with concentration. Then there is another vertical line to signify the phase boundary between the cathode solution and the cathode itself. And lastly, the material in the cathode, which is solid silver. Let's note that spectator ions are not listed. Those are the nitrate ions and sodium ions, and the simplest form of each half reaction is shown, so all the coefficients are 1. Let's try one just to make sure we can write in cell notation. Here is a redox reaction. What is the cell notation that describes the galvanic cell that utilizes this redox reaction? Well, first let's recognize that this would be the oxidation half reaction, and therefore this is the anode. This is the reduction half reaction, hence this will be the cathode. So let's use the simplest form of these half reactions to construct the cell notation. We have the chromium anode, the anode solution, and on the other side of the salt bridge, there's the cathode solution and the copper cathode. And those are the basics regarding the structure of a galvanic cell. We should now be able to name and describe the components of the galvanic cell, as well as identify oxidation and reduction half reactions, and represent galvanic cells with cell notation. Let's continue to learn more about galvanic cells. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.